Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome. Uh, I'm Ali Malkawi, and on behalf of the Harvard Center for Green Buildings and Cities and the Harvard School of Design, I'm truly honored to introduce our distinguished guest, Lord Foster, to deliver the inaugural lecture as we commemorate the center's first anniversary. Our mission is to transform the global building industry through a design-centric strategy that links in-depth research to the development of new processes, systems, and products. We are proud of the fact that this is the only center of, the, of its kind, pursuing long-term objectives through an integrated approach that focuses on design and promotes the innovative use of materials and systems to support sustainability. It's our firm belief that there are few, if any, initiatives that would do more to enhance our planet's environment and improve the quality of daily life than to bring green design and construction into the mainstream. If we are successful and we are designed uh, to do so, the impact will be measurable and experienced worldwide. Toward that end, the center tonight begins its sponsorship of an annual lecture within the, uh, pro within the prestigious Harvard Graduate School of Design lecture series. Our goal is to inform and inspire students, faculty, and the public regarding the importance of green design, building, and planning. We hope that this evening bring, becomes part of another cherished Harvard tradition, and Lord Foster is appropriately the first speaker in our series. When it comes to the subject of green buildings and cities, you may be aware of the fact that he was a very, very early adapter. In fact, he has been worldwide leader in green, sustainable design and planning for almost 50 years. Lord Foster is a pioneering British architect and the founder and chairman of Foster & Partners, an internationally acclaimed firm known for its signature design philosophy that combines high level of innovations with environmental sensitivity. His list of honors and those of his firm are simply too long to recite. Instead, we included them in your program. As most of you know, among those honors is the Priskler Prize, which is appropriately known as the Nobel Prize of Architecture. I can think of no one better suited to give voice to members of the global design profession who embody the intentions of the center and whose work is consistent with our principles we espouse. In addition, Lord Foster's experiences, philosophies, projects, and practices resonate with our students and future generations of architects, designers, and planners of the urban landscape. He and his work are well known in virtually every corner of the world, and our area is no exception. We have a lot to learn from him, and I know that all of us are looking forward to his talk. We'll hear from Lord Foster in a moment, but first I would like to invite my dean, Moisin Mustavavi, Dean of the Graduate School of Design to speak about Foster for a few minutes. Okay. Thank you, thank you Ali and congratulations to you, the center and really um, thank you all for being here. It's a, it's a wonderful evening. I think Norman there's no pressure, right? I mean you have to you have to now cover everything. It's really uh, an incredible opportunity for us to have Lord and Lady Foster here. Uh, they're friends of the school, they're friends of this area, and I think it's, it's great for us to have them here. Um, just because this is now a very formal event, perhaps it would be appropriate for me to be very informal and to, uh, to speak just a little bit personally about my own experience, because I think you know, it's very, um, very easy for us to think about the significant number of, of projects and buildings. If you think about Stansted and the importance of that for airport design, if you think about, uh, you know, um, the HSBC building in, in Hong Kong and the importance of that for office buildings and the creation of public spaces, there's building after building, project after project that has really made significant contribution. And that is absolutely certain and that is very exciting and very important. But I want to tell you that when I was a, when I was a student, I used to walk along a street called Great Portland Street and that is a place where Norman and his practice had one of their first offices. And they had taken uh, an existing building and they had converted the ground floor of this building and it was in a way like a very big shop. Uh, 
with a shop front, except that this was a very special glass facade on the street, and one got to have a little peek inside the office because they had also Venetian blinds behind the glass, so you could just get a sense of the interior. And the way in which the flatness of that glass related to the kind of existing context of that traditional street was really something very inspiring to see how this practice had really just with very few moves, very simple things, had tried to make their presence uh, felt in the city. But actually, you also got to see the inside of the office, and you started dreaming about the kinds of things that they were doing. And they were doing lots and lots of great things. And this was also about the, the, the sort of period where I think the Willis Faber building uh, got built. And for those of you who don't know this building, I would really recommend that you have a look at it, because I think it's one of the early important buildings of uh, Lord Foster, a building that sits in the middle of a site in Ipswich and is, again, glass reflective, but with curved corners. Very special, very unusual building. For me, now, today, when I was actually thinking about, uh, welcome, when I was thinking about, um, 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 about Lord Foster, I realized that this, actually, this period, this moment, this, the facade of the, the office, the Willis Faber, it actually was very important in terms of the creation, the formation of an aesthetic of a kind of look, of an appearance, which was very particular. There were lots of other architects of the time who were also interested in the relationship of technology to architecture. But I think there was something very specific in the really the, the, the attention to the simplicity of uh, the pieces that, that, um, that was created during this time. So when I look at the iPhone, or look at the smartphone, I feel in some ways that there's a lot of sympathy in terms of what Jonathan Ives is doing today with the Apple computers, with the iPhone, and really the aesthetic that, that Norman was, was thinking about in the, in the 60s and 70s. Uh, the other tiny thing that I'd say, because I, 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 we all want to hear from Norman, the other tiny thing is really over the years just getting to find out about um, <clears throat> Lord Foster's relationship with Buckminster Fuller, and really how the idea of each one of his buildings was also something that represented the idea of, of a condition that transcended the individual building, that the individual building stood for something that was about a different sense of the future, of the role of architecture for the built environment, and of course, the, sensi the sensitivities towards the, the, the whole sort of set of environmental concerns and conditions and the very nature of how things are made. Um, so I think the combination of being the person who really thought up this idea of a kind of aesthetic that is so prevalent today and that we feel so close to and really for also developing an architecture that um, is uh, so relevant in terms of its, uh, its link to the built environment I think we have a wonderful inaugural speaker for the Center for Green, for green Buildings and Cities. So please welcome uh, Lord Foster of uh, Thames Bank. I think um, green is probably a shorthand for environmental awareness. And the Green Movement probably started around 50 years ago. And it was about 50 years ago that I started practicing as an architect. And the issue of sustainability has been a guiding principle ever since then, right from the beginning. And, um, and I remember saying at one point, when quizzed on the subject, that it wasn't about fashion, it was about survival. Uh, the one thing that, perhaps stating the obvious, uh, what green is not, it's not some kind of magic powder that you can sprinkle 
on a project afterwards, uh, stick a windmill on top, uh, a kind of retrofit. Um, it is right at the very core of design. And that green thread is one of many. And if I talk about that and I emphasize that, then it should perhaps be a warning before that, that it, it's, it's a critically important issue, but it's one of many. The social agenda, the technology as a means to the end, the role of structure, the constraints of resources, of cost and time, they're all woven in. Another thing to state the obvious is that it's not some kind of medicine that's going to be good for you, but you're going to have to suffer as a consequence. Um, I'd suggest quite the reverse, that a true green building actually heightens your awareness of the elements of nature. It's rather like uh, the luxury of a picnic where you choose the view, dappled shade, and you have the changes of the seasons. And perhaps in a way, the birth of the green movement was related to an escape to nature, a sense of rediscovery. And, um, and perhaps the pioneers, such as Rachel Carson, who drew attention to uh, the dangers to, uh, of chemicals, of DDT, to the environment, Bucky, um, with his spaceship Earth, um, and that time when perhaps for the first time uh, human beings saw the planet from a distance. So this um, awareness of the fragility of the planet. And Bucky, who I was privileged to work with, to collaborate for the last 12 years of his, uh, his life, um, was arguably the first green architect. Although green as a coin, uh, coin word uh, was to come uh, one decade later in the, in the 70s. Um, if this is a sort of intuitive awareness as a first stage of the green movement, then 30 years later, uh, there is an attempt to quantify that in terms of the environment. And, um, and it's interesting that there are 28 different uh, rating systems around the globe. And, um, and it's perhaps the earliest one was BRIAM. Uh, in the United Kingdom. But the one that has really penetrated deeper than any other and global acceptance is undoubtedly the American LEED standard. And it's quite interesting just to see the way in which from the early mid-90s that proliferated um, and you can just see the sort of ticker tape at the bottom left of the year and then the way in which that has become um, a kind of standard uh, globally. And, um, and finally, uh, where we are at this point in time, and the red being the most sustainable of the rating. Um, but the criteria is essentially environmental, so it is about the building. And, um, and these are the kind of headlines of the criteria. And important though these are, they measure the performance of the building in terms of the environment. And I would suggest that they've been long overtaken by far more important criteria. And that's not to underestimate the environmental impact, use of energy, degrees of pollution. But really, the true green building is about a much wider, more holistic view of, of design. And what is interesting now is that you can quantify um, those uh, aspects which hitherto have been much more uh, intuitive. And the criteria of LEED is very much about a steady state of the environment. And you can measure that in terms of the blood flow in the zone of the brain that relates to it. And if you, if you move into an environment which has change, then it's quite interesting that you can measure distinctly increased patterns of blood flow. In other words, um, 
the sky as an inspiration, which for me, from earliest sketches as an architect, always looms large in the picture. And, um, and that intuitive feeling of capturing the sky, of the qualities of changing light, um, uh, now is much more quantifiable. And that humanistic, that poetic, that spiritual dimension of design is for me completely wrapped up with all the technology of, of how the building eventually breathes and communes with, with nature. Um, in terms of uh, the health of a, of, a, of a building, that is also inseparable from the use of energy. And it's interesting that if you just look at these charts, then those societies which are heavy consumers of energy have the lowest infant mortality, the highest rate of life expectancy. And also in terms of mental spiritual, they offer the greatest potential for development, political and sexual freedom. So if we, if we talk a little about energy, it's interesting just to analyze what are the consumers of energy? And in an industrialized society, then buildings probably account for between 30 to 40, 35 to 40 percent of the energy uh, produced and consumed. And a similar amount is consumed in the infrastructure. If we think of the infrastructure as the kind of urban glue that binds together the individual buildings and the communities of the city, the connections, the public transport, the bridges, the flights between, between continents. So that totals in an industrialized society probably around 75% of the, of the energy. But um, if, I, if I then move to, uh, to the less developed, the emerging economies, that perhaps is summed up by this image of Caracas. And the infrastructure of that highway separates the ordered world as we know it, the world we've been talking about with the previous uh, images, and on the left-hand side is the informal settlements, which account for a huge number of people, a huge proportion of humanity. And perhaps it's just interesting to contemplate that in that less developed emerging world, the amount of energy that we in this room individually consume annually is the equivalent of two people in Japan, six people in Mexico, 13 people in China, 31 people in India, and 370 people in Ethiopia. And, um, and if we talk about the need, the moral imperative, if you like, to produce more energy, then we come right back to Bucky's dictum the, the imperative is to do more with less. And if there are 1.6 billion uh, who don't have access to power, to electricity, and we have the need to produce more energy, then it's how cleanly we produce that energy because there's a direct relationship between that pollution and climate change, and arguably the strongest threat to global society, to the planet. And um, if we talk about pollution, then we're likely to think of China, uh, a city like Beijing. But it's also easy to forget that it wasn't that long ago that London was exactly the same circumstances. So in 1952, there was the great smog, and the newspaper headlines talked about this 30-mile belt that brought the capital city uh, to a standstill. And it's interesting to look back over 50 years in terms of London as one city and just see the way in which 
the level of pollution as measured by particles with the blue line, excuse me, with the green line, um, and uh, sulfur dioxide with the, with the red line. And the big change came about through an act of parliament which was called the United Kingdom Clean Air Act. And you can see that point and you can see that dramatic drop. Um, and the slight rise in the green line there um, we reckon is the result of the very powerful encouragement in Europe towards diesel. And that, of course, links back into the whole VW um, scandal and so on. Um, but we won't go off in that uh, diversion. Um, I would say that in terms of energy, the blue line above, the, when it comes to buildings, I've learned over time that the high-tech element symbolized here by those fighters, that if you really want to make use of the high technology, then you've got to get the low technology right. And the low technology is symbolized uh, by the pyramid. And remember that those fighters in 10 years' time will be obsolete and that technology will move on. So in buildings, there has to be the flexibility to be able to accommodate those, those changes of, of, of technology. The pyramid is quite useful in terms of trying to convey a principle. And that is that the base of the pyramid is about the shape, the volume of the building, its form. And you get the maximum environmental gain with the minimum investment. And that as you move towards the peak of the pyramid and you're seeing elements like the degree of insulation, the ventilation, the orientation, the shading, and it is at the top of the pinnacle. That is the high technology element. Um, every year there's a prize in Switzerland in my name for, um, for solar energy to encourage uh, clean, green uh, buildings. And, um, and I thought it might just be interesting to look at this year's winner. There are two winners, one for new buildings and others for recycled, um, uh, uh, converted uh, buildings. So just looking at the new one and applying some of those principles, this is essentially a compact form. It's a three-story office building, small office building. Um, and that compact form, very efficient, encloses the maximum volume, volume with the minimum amount of surface area. And it's heavily insulated. It's triple glazed and it's shaded. Those, that is the, is the equivalent of the lower part of the pyramid, which enables those photovoltaic cells on the roof to, for the building to generate nearly two and a half times the amount of energy that it needs. So it's feeding one and a half times the energy back into the national grid, the electrical grid of, of, of Switzerland. Um, for many, many years as a pilot, flight has been an inspiration in, in all kinds of ways. And um, this is one of the many different types of aircraft that I've, I've flown. For me, it's highly symbolic. It's um, a Caproni, two-seater. And in 1975, with another pilot, we set a UK speed record. We went 300 kilometers uh, at an average speed of 90 kilometers an hour. And, um, and that machine is purely driven by solar, has no engine, no propeller. And, um, and it raises the thought of the prospect of a building being essentially, for most of the year, perhaps driven by the forces uh, of nature. And, um, and when we come to... Uh, for me, the tree is inspirational, not just as the ultimate structure, but also symbolic of the changes of the, of the season and the way in which the building breathes, absorbs carbon dioxide, rather in the way 
the, the traditional shallow plan building breathes. And this going back 50 years was the start of the practice in a residential apartment in Hampstead. And you open the building, you open the window for the building to breathe. If it was hot, you open it. If it was cold, you closed it. Um, and the challenges of a small team in a small apartment um, what happens when you magnify that and you want spaces which are large, open, uh, deep? Uh, here, our main studio uh, in London, 50 years later, captures the view, sunshine, uh, north facing. Um, and the inspiration for that, the model, goes back some, uh, some years earlier. And it was, interestingly, the first project of the practice, and it was a, a small amenity centre in London docks for a Norwegian company called Olsen's, and, um, and that was portrayed by the artist Ben Johnson in this painting. And if you peeled back that facade, which was uh, the first example in the United Kingdom of a high-performance glass, heat and light uh, reflecting, and the deep plan, highly efficient. So this had a very, very powerful energy agenda. Uh, the, uh, the light fittings were coupled to the extract for the, um, uh, for the ventilation system, would take the heat away uh, at source. And if you pulled it back, this would be the kind of anatomy of the building. Other agendas here, the social agenda was very much about breaking down the barriers between the workers, the dockers, and management, all under one roof, which was pretty revolutionary uh, at that time. And um, we talk about buildings that breathe and that sit lightly and don't disturb the landscape. And an unbuilt project, but hugely influential at that time, was for Olsen's in a forest just outside uh, Oslo, a place called Vespi. Uh, very beautiful forest, and although the project didn't happen, it would have relocated uh, Fred Olsen's enterprise from uh, downtown Oslo out to this um, uh, kind of bucolic uh, setting. And the proposition was that the buildings would sit lightly, almost like a, an insect in the forest, just touching the ground, and very much about the theme of light, lightness, touching the ground gently. And, um, and here, the model. But the drawing at that time was also quite interesting because it was about this, these themes of taking the air from the cool forest floor, pulling it through the building, um, and having this contact with nature, with the elements, reducing the energy, and using mirrors to bounce the sun into, uh, into the building and, uh, and to, uh, to give that uh, dimension. And I mentioned that, um, that sketches which recur from when I was a student were also very, very much about the sky and the humanizing qualities of, uh, of, of sunshine and the way in which that might infuse a building. And again, the building very much about uh, a lifestyle ascending to the roof and at the lower level, a kind of communal uh, swimming pool. Uh, so a building literally colored green um, and, and promoting this idea of, of energy and lifestyle and the fact that they could be a, a harmonious relationship between them. And the literally landscape green roof, highly insulating, and the deep plan, so a very, very uh, efficient building. And this is in the, in the 1970s. And uh, Mosin referred to it earlier. This is the curved, uh, the, the glass that is highly reflective during the day, uh, but very transparent in the, uh, at, at night. And perhaps, interestingly, to show the way in which we have developed as a practice with greater and greater investment in research, I thought it might be interesting to show the equivalent of that building today, which um, is, a, is a project, very advanced stage of construction. It was topped out uh, a few weeks ago. It's the headquarters and enclosed here by the red line for Bloomberg. 
And at the heart of the main building, which is the one on the left, there's a public arcade, a route that cuts right through uh, the building and is a continuation of an old Roman road. So again, a lot of these buildings are also inspired and informed by the history of the site, the history of the, of the institution, the company, the museum, uh, whatever. At the heart of that building is, um, is an atrium and that atrium is the, uh, is the conduit that pulls the air through. And this is a breathing building. And here you can see the movement of the air through to the center. And in terms of anticipating the performance of this building, um, the, the, we, we've gone about it in four ways. And I just thought it might be interesting on this one project, just to look at a little more depth at the research behind it. One of the four different ways of exploring how air will move is to use a water tank model. And this is the testing facility. That is the Perspex model, a very, very large model that we made with electrical filaments to add some heat and excite the movement of the, of the water and a very, very short film just to show how the dye in that water will simulate the movement of the air uh, and, and pull it through. And uh, for some reason, that animation didn't seem to work. Give it another try. Yes, finally. It was quick. Um, now you see it, now you don't. Um, uh, a, the reality of that in, the, in that atrium, which is very much about the environmental systems, the pulling of fresh air through the building, is also the ramp that allows a pedestrian connection at the heart of the building and encourages uh, the flow and the communication out from this floor. The social dimension is this is the pantry floor. Everybody goes to that floor and then they disperse to the other floors through, uh, through the building. Um, the, uh, the element on the facade that enables the building to breathe started off originally as a device that would reduce the amount of glass and provide shading uh, to reduce the, the solar gain. And in the early stages of design, uh, the idea of a breathing building with a degree of natural ventilation, a high degree of natural ventilation, emerged relatively late in the, in the process. And, um, and the one on the extreme left is the one that doesn't breathe, it's just a fixed fin. And then this exploration of fins is looking at the engineering implications uh, and at the same time exploring the appearance. And the ones that we didn't like, some of them were good performers, some of the ones that we like visually were not so good performers. And finally, we end up right at the extreme right with a high performer and we love the appearance. Um, and so it's, it's this kind of almost like um, a creative process where you're going backwards and forwards between the aesthetics and the, and the environmental uh, performance. And, and then seeking to use test facilities to explore the, um, the, the and I don't know why that, um, there was an image where it says test section, um, but it's somehow gone missing. But there are two different uh, attenuators, one a spiral and one a linear. And, and again, we set the performance criteria and finally we exceed the performance criteria uh, that, we, that we set. And um, what I'm going to show you on the next image, which if it does appear as it should, is um, is a test facility, a small film. And what we did is we built 
in a large uh, warehouse, we built part of this space. And you'll see the warehouse, you'll see the enclosure that we created. Then you'll see the chilled ceiling, which is also the lighting in the ceiling plane there. Um, you'll see the equipment for simulating the climate to make it warm, to make it cool. You'll see smoke entering it to check the air movement. And you'll see kind of robot-like cyl cylinders, which are representing individuals with monitors. And, um, and that is the air movement through the gills. And here's the finally. So here you can see the weather zone. The circular elements are individuals. The desking is uh, of the configuration. The fan is bringing the air in. The doors are opening to the grills. The smoke is coming in um, to show the movement of air is being recorded. And then it's looking at it in all kinds of different situations from winter to, to summer. But just giving an insight into the uh, research behind the project. But the most powerful argument um, emerges through the studies over a 20-year period, which looks at the productivity in terms of individuals um, as a result of being in a building where there is that relationship to the outside world in terms of air movement. And if, the, if you take the average of that, that is something like $3,900 per employee per year. So if you're talking about a building, which in the case of one project I'll be showing you for Apple, where you have uh, 12,000 people in one building, you probably have about 4,000 in this building. It's quite powerful. But interestingly, I discovered when I was putting this together with a colleague uh, that it was only, uh, I think, last week that from uh, the uh, Department of, uh, of Public uh, Health here, um, that there's been a study much more focused. And it shows on the brown bar a conventional building. And then the mid-green is a building with natural ventilation as a major component. And the super green is the tall one there. And this is interesting because for the first time, it's focused on particular tasks like orientation, crisis response, seeking information, breadth of approach, strategy. So again, uh, that is, 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 is quantified. And, um, and it's those arguments that in the end, in terms of health and well-being, are powerful arguments in favor of a green architecture. And hopefully, we'll now see the site with Apple, thank goodness. Um, <laughs> so the 24 essentially become two buildings uh, the huge amount of tarmac shrinks to virtually nothing. The landscape is 120 acres, returning it back to the kind of landscape when it was the fruit bowl uh, of the United States. Uh, nearly 10,000 uh, trees um, and more people. And, um, and that building is set in the landscape with something like five miles of, of trails. And the building and its setting about rediscovering the benefits of the California landscape, and like many of these buildings, will be working uh, with the air at ambient temperature outside for uh, 75, 80 percent of the of the year. And um, in terms of integrated design, this is showing the movement of the air into the building at the head of the window and the structural elements which integrate uh, the cooling tubes and the voids to also move air. The building, uh, around a mile in uh, circumference, 
But in terms of connectivity and communication, of course, one single building rather than 24 spread over the entire site um, is essentially a compact building and brings us back to uh, that pyramid. So the form of the building is very, very important in terms of its energy. And this building produces exactly the amount of energy that it consumes. So it's independent in, in, in those terms. It, if I go back to a building which was our first um, breathing uh, building, this was a, a combined uh, museum for a private collection at the University of East Anglia called the Sainsbury Centre, which under its roof also um, encompassed a school of, uh, of fine art. And, um, and the structural zone around that is, is pulls in the air from outside and the tubular form of the building captures the view. And as you can see, it's very, very much about, about natural light. And the expression of that building in the landscape, and here you can see the, uh, the roof lights and its connections to the world of, of, of aviation. And, um, and the technology is, um, is related to, to that world. And, um, and it was, in many ways, the model for a generation of airports that would, uh, that would follow from that. And the mission of the first airport was to question the then traditional form of a terminal. And this was typical, it's Heathrow Terminal 4, but it could have been any terminal around the world at that time. And, um, and by questioning the separation by the roof and all the heavy uh, services and machinery, which essentially cut out any connection with, with nature, by literally turning it upside down, putting all that heavy equipment underneath uh, the main concourse and opening up the roof to sunshine uh, and light great savings of energy, but also a much more um, human, poetic um, experience. Again, uh, the contact with, with nature. And so if that was um, revolutionary uh, and a model which has since been adopted, uh, we've developed it much further. So occasionally uh, a project will completely rethink a building type and then the uh, designs which will follow explore that and develop it in an evolutionary way. And I could give, I could relate that by, uh, back to other worlds of, of, of design. So in that evolutionary phase, uh, Hong Kong airport is, is a kind of step along the way. The structure and the lighting are part of the orientation. Um, and this is a building constructed on a very rapid uh, program on a site which really didn't exist. It was sea water, uh, so the site had to be uh, created. And I describe it uh, with its connections to the world outside and nature above as a kind of analog experience in a digital uh, world. And uh, taking that uh, a step further, Beijing Airport, something like, two and a half times the size of, of Hong Kong, currently uh, the largest in the world. Um, and again, that roof plays a major environmental role, but it also is uh, highly symbolic in terms of its color, the color of the uh, roofs of the Forbidden City, and uh, referred to as the lo by the locals as dragon-like in, 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 in its experience. And also the um, the use of colour, uh, and uh, so the gateway to a nation and evocative of many of the symbols of that, of that nation. At this particular point, um, with the opportunity for a competition for Terminal Mexico City, uh, it was the chance to make a leap, a kind of another revolutionary leap, and to say, would it be possible to 
uh, take away the columns. This has a roof, it has vertical window walls, it has columns, uh, it has things that reach out to the aircraft. Would it be possible to do one membrane that would eliminate the columns and really do everything? If these are uh, 36 meter spans, uh, something like 120 feet, could we make the leap to uh, much larger spans, uh, 340, 570? And um, and that was the, the move, and this is the project which makes that leap, is now in detailed design, will be starting on site early next year. And, um, and just to give a feel for the aesthetics of this as a, as a terminal, as a space, this um, kind of fly-through will give some flavors of the, the scale, the light, the lightness, the quality of that light as, uh, as one moves through it. And the way in which that single uh, membrane can form uh, the supports to the ground. And the ground conditions in Mexico City being, uh, it's really like a kind of moist uh, lake-like uh, strata and um, an earthquake zone. So this as a structural form is very forgiving and can, uh, can move with the uh, with the ground, with the ground movement. So it's very much of its, of its place. The, those projects also owe much uh, from the past in terms of the exploration with large span uh, structures, the British Museum, and the way in which uh, the heating and cooling elements are threaded literally into the very fabric of the, of, of the building. But, but a, a lot of these as explorations have emerged over time and the roots of the way in which this as a space is heated um, and cooled is embedded in the floor and goes back to uh, 1965 with a small factory um, an electronics factory, which also, in terms of its social agenda at that point, was bringing management and the assembly line uh, under one roof as a democratic pavilion. And in this cutaway, you can see the way in which those small bore pipes, which as a, as a means of discreetly heating and cooling, creating a very, very large radiator in the form of the floor, um, these have developed uh, over that 50-year period and are particularly relevant in the case of how you climate control a historic building without compromising the history and the fabric of the building. And the Reichstag as a competition to create the symbolic uh, parliament, putting the public above the, the politicians, a very powerful uh, ecological agenda, uh, a manifesto, if you like, for renewable energy. And here you can see the way in which the light is reflected into the chamber uh, deep below. And the various technologies which come together to, uh, to make that possible. So it's biomass, um, photovoltaics, aquifers, uh, deep uh, below the ground, and um, and all of those with a very powerful encouragement of a, of a culture, although this was not part of the brief any more than the public space. So that was something as architects, as advocates, uh, we were able to, uh, to bring to bear. Um, it's perhaps no accident that we also in this German environment, which was very much pro-sustainability, uh, were able to create the world's first um, skyscraper that would, uh, that would breathe. And um, if we were talking about a 94% reduction in carbon with the Reichstag, we're talking about a 50% reduction here. This is in the late 1990s, and, um, and literally the gardens in the sky were the green lungs of the building. And here you can see with the red line, the window 
that opens and which gives this uh, natural ventilation to everybody within the building. And that is working at ambient temperature for 85% of the year. This was the competition sketch um, that preceded it. And um, another building in which the, uh, the green lungs of the building spiral uh, around. And here you can see the way in which the windows open to give that uh, degree of, of, of ventilation to reduce the, the energy. But also uh, in all of these buildings, they're also uh, very much about how uh, the city will connect. And here the potential to have downward and upward views as well as the conventional horizontal view. So very much about the quality of life for the uh, for the occupants of the of the building, and um, and the first uh, lead accredited uh, gold standard in New York was our Hearst building here, using a lot of recycled uh, steel, and where everything is working as part of the ecological plan. So the water feature there by Jamie Carter, uh, the cascade is also part of the cooling system, which is taking away waste heat, converting it into cooling. So it's a holistic view. Um, and also using the historic base hollowed out as the kind of social heart, the entrance that brings together all the different magazine titles in the, in the Hearst um, uh, organization. And, um, and perhaps the, the first of these high rises um, was the Hong Kong Bank. And, um, and the radical thing there, the revolutionary element, was to take the traditional center core of a building uh, and split it and move it to the outer edges so that you would see through the building and you would have open deep space. The ability to create a dealer's floor, for example, which they did late in the life of the building. And the way in which the mirrors which you saw in that forest in, in Norway uh, are used here to deflect sunlight deep into uh, the heart of the space. And, um, and that building, with its undercroft, its view down to the public space uh, below, looking down, which is a kind of great venue at the weekends, the kind, uh, a community comes together under there. And so all of these buildings, each in their different ways, connects with the infrastructure of the, of, of the city. And, um, and that infrastructure, which I referred to earlier, again, considerations of that are inseparable from the sustainability of, of, of cities and how, um, if we've talked about the individual buildings, then looking at the infrastructure that binds those buildings together. This graph shows that as you reduce the density and the cities sprawl, like Atlanta, Houston, Los Angeles, Detroit, um, the energy consumption kind of explodes. And the most sustainable cities in terms of the minimizing the use of energy are, are higher density communities. Given that they have mixture, good mix of use, good public transport, they're pedestrian friendly, high density. So anything you can do with an existing city to improve those qualities will improve its level of sustainability. And if we just looked at the carbon footprints of those different kinds of cities, so London, Marseille, and Hong Kong, high density, compared with Atlanta, low density, very high consumption of energy. And, um, and if we look at the footprint of those cities and we compare it with the footprint of Atlanta, you see that London has the same population as Atlanta, but its carbon footprint is one seventh of, of Atlanta. And you put those three cities and you still have a footprint which is smaller than Atlanta. So again, if you take a city like Marseille, and you can improve, make it more pedestrian friendly, um, make it improve the quality of public transport. Marseille started around its historic port, 
and it lost that connection by ill-planned roads that consumed some of the most desirable elements of the city. And our work there, which is a 20-year plan, we've done the first four or five years of that. And here you can see uh, the, 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 the transformation of that area. And a new kind of outdoor cafe life has returned uh, back to the, to the port. There are individual small buildings that we've done. I just show one here, which is a kind of uh, market hall. It just has a reflective uh, ceiling in polished stainless steel, which again gives a, a kind of playful element. Uh, and and it's, it's very much about bringing back the people to the port. And I could, um, I could also talk about uh, in infrastructure, the intervention of a highway and the way in which that might reduce the environmental impact and improve levels of sustainability. And um, in an area not too far from here, in the Tarn Valley, we did a viaduct. And the viaduct uh, tackled the issue of the main route from Paris to Perpignan. And a small part of that route was incomplete, so the traffic would build up through a neighboring village. And the traffic would build up to five hour uh, jams, um, uh, 20 miles in, in length. And this project, which was our viaduct, uh, tackled that. But the object was also to create something that might be beautiful, to demonstrate that you could make that physical intervention. And it might be something that was desirable to see and the dialogue between that and the natural world. This is something like 70, the tallest support here is 17 meters uh, higher than the Eiffel Tower. So it is the, the highest motorway uh, as an elevated uh, structure. And um, if you just took the statistics for the heavy goods vehicles and ignored all those cars um, and you you, you translated in a year the uh, 40,000 tons of carbon dioxide that would be reduced by eliminating those five hour uh, delays, then that is the equivalent of planting something like 40,000 trees or taking 115,000 cars out of the, the, the system. So unexpectedly, a motorway which you would never think of as being a symbol of sustainability is exactly uh, that. And coming back to the city and making it more friendly, more sustainable, uh, some years back uh, we tackled uh, Trafalgar Square. This was a metropolitan-wide project because just to make a small improvement in the heart of the city uh, had far-reaching consequences right out to the very edge of the metropolis. So that was the space which most people have now long forgotten because uh, memories are short. And, um, and the body of that space was totally isolated from its surroundings. So now uh, with that intervention, it becomes a much more noble uh, setting for the uh, historic buildings. And, um, and if we look at another intervention, again in terms of improving the quality of life in the city. This is our Millennium Bridge, the first pedestrian bridge on the axis of St. Paul's, um, which also brought a new level of prosperity and connectivity. And using um, computer predictions, this was the, uh, the model. You can see the, the dark horizontal line across that, which is the, the, the Thames. This is before and the effect of that bridge is, uh, is quite profound. It's brought a, a kind of ripple effect and a, a new level of prosperity to the area. If you moved out to the Thames estuary to the right of that image um, on the uh, black line of the river, um, that is the site for a project which is currently underway for a wind farm which will uh, power something like 500,000 homes and is a joint uh, venture between um, Abu Dhabi 
and London. And in Abu Dhabi, we, hear, we, we see here the uh, project which is under construction at the moment, which is 100 uh, megawatt concentrated power. These are not photovoltaics. Uh, these are parabolic mirrors which concentrate the energy of the sun, focus that on a tube through which there is a, a, a liquid, heats that up to something like 730 degrees uh, centigrade, and that powers a turbine which then generates electricity. This is the outcome, one of many experiments from the Mazda project that we, uh, that we did. And the, uh, the Mazda project, uh, as a as a small film here. This film is a mixture of um, virtual reality and reality. So some parts of it like this um, is exactly what is there now. Other parts like this little bit um, are from the original uh, renderings that sought to show what it would be like when it was constructed. So it's a mixture of those things. It goes between virtual reality, anticipatory design, and what is actually there and happening. This is now a community of several hundred. In a very, very short space of time, it will be several thousand. Um, and it's, it's, growing, it's growing by the day. It uses a number of quite uh, traditional uh, devices which have come out of a study of indigenous buildings. Here you can see how it is now, still shots. Um, and we move through, you'll see some of the workspaces. The Mazdar Institute is devoted to the study of renewable energies, to a world beyond uh, fossil fuels. This is reality here that you see. This is virtual uh, reality. And, um, and it learns, it, it, is, it is getting that base technology in such a way that the photovoltaics that drive that then can give the improved quality, the performance. And, um, and blazing at night is a very energy intensive building because essentially it, it's, it's, um, it's laboratories and they're 24 hours, they're very heavy consumers of, of energy. And it is, um, it is this 10 megawatt um, solar farm that is primarily uh, driving this, uh, this project. And, um, if, we, if this is one kind of, um, of experiment, then um, looking at another experiment to explore the way in which perhaps an, one of those informal settlements might be transformed without actually bulldozing the community and, um, and kind of starting again, all of which have, uh, for the most part, been social uh, failures. And, um, and so the, the site is, um, is a suburb of, uh, of Mumbai, Dharavi, it's 175 hectares. It's about the size of Hyde Park. It's a million people, very, very uh, high density. And uh, Narinda, who's on the front row here, and a colleague went out there and, um, and engaged with the local community. And some of the questions that they asked was in the yellow ring building there. Why that building as a new response? Because the, uh, the city authorities had cleared part of the, uh, of the site and erected 14-story buildings. And they were vacant and empty. And, um, and so Narinda here, uh, part of the team with that local community, and asking those questions and finding out what made this community tick. What kind of spaces were needed for the activities that sustained their recycling activities, the pottery making, the bread making? And what was behind those facades? And postulating that perhaps by the discrete insertion of services um, and, and clearing away a few buildings, creating uh, some more public space, but essentially respecting the, uh, the physical arteries and the social arteries of the, of the community. And, um, and here, taking one of those spaces and exploring the potential to insert those vital uh, services that would transform the quality of life. It was also 
uh, suggested in one of the conversations on the subject with an industrialist that, that perhaps that was important, but even more important would be to raise the quality of living uh, by an input of technology and to provide facilities to improve the quality of life in, in the rural countryside and to halt, to slow down the influx into uh, the cities. And that led to uh, a concept which has been a personal interest over many decades, and that is what would happen if instead of buying all those individual consumer items, the fridge which projects waste heat, which is thrown away uh, from the back of the machine, uh, if you could harness and integrate all these different elements into one kind of uh, heart unit, and then you connected that to solar, and you use the lessons of the automotive industry. So that I think is, is, is interesting. Um, and, uh, and all of these kind of research, experimental uh, projects, some of the, um, the inspirations come from techniques that we've developed within the practice. So for example, pioneering uh, with universities, the use of three-dimensional printing, led the European Space Agency to approach us about a project for lunar dwellings. And that, uh, and that project uh, uses a combination of technologies to be able to take the minimum amount of equipment out to the moon and the element which detaches itself creates an inflatable there's a robot which mixes the earth's uh, the the lunar uh, dust called regolith mixes it with an adhesive which is flown out and the three-dimensional printer using um, inspirations from uh, bone cells, animal cells, uh, to create a very, very strong structure that would resist the impact of meteorites, would handle something like the uh, 400 degree temperature changes. And, um, and that technology that we developed there, interestingly, provided some of the clues working with the elements on the moon's surface, some of the clues for a project in Africa. Again, this one uh, with Narinda, who's on the left there with the school kids that he was teaching, drawing in Sierra Leone. And, um, and that project um, led to uh, the, uh, a, current, a current concept of combining the kind of high technology of drones, which we associate with killing and violence and wars, um, and turning them to humanitarian uh, purposes to uh, deliver in Africa, to leapfrog the infrastructure, um, which will arguably, will it ever catch up in a continent which is the second largest a population of 1.2 billion and by 2050 uh, will have doubled. And by that time, one in four people on the planet will be uh, African. Uh, um, and, and, um, and so that, um, it's worth just raising the, uh, the issue of infrastructure um, to deliver medical supplies. So if we say that one third of that continent live within two kilometers of an all season road, then Narinda's little video clip here shows what an all season uh, road is. So that is the infrastructure network. And, um, and as somebody said, if a child is dying through lack of blood um, and waiting for a transfusion, then the drone as a concept would cut this down, uh, this travel time, down to one-tenth of, uh, of, <coughs> of the time. There's Narinda going to school uh, <laughs> for his drawing class. And so um, just the, the need for, if it was not delivering vital parts, perhaps to repair a pump, which a community might be dependent upon 
for water, and they can't get it until that spare part is delivered. But particularly the issue of, of, of blood and, and the, um, the potential for the uh, drone, two types of drone, um, one which could deliver with a range of 50 kilometers, a payload of 10 kilos, which would be 20 uh, transfusions. And, uh, and the larger drone with a much larger payload uh, that would be much more about, um, about delivering larger items and freight. And um, the country that the project will uh, take off in is Rwanda. Three drone ports, uh, uh, the sites have been identified. Um, the administration is sympathetic. It's a joint venture between foundations um, and uh, university, EPFL, in Lausanne, um, and an in individual who's a, an African uh, exp expert who was headhunted uh, by the university. And, um, and so that, uh, the connection, of course, here with the Lunar Project is that, that that on the moon you were having to use the materials that were to hand and you were using robots. Here you want to create job opportunities. You want to be able to empower a community, to be able to develop an industry, buildings, not just the drone ports, but a building type that would be appropriate for schools, for libraries, for medical centers, um, for civic market halls. Um, and so it would be exporting the machinery and the kilns, if bricks were not, or tiles, ceramics available uh, locally. And, and so the, that's the parallel between the two, because it is working with the materials that are to hand. And, um, and the final film clip has just been uh, a part of a larger film to convey the essence of the project, the peaceful use of a drone to deliver a, a payload and the way in which the drone port would be a kind of community building that would uh, be a gathering point. And um, so in this country with millions and millions of mobile phones where everybody has access to that as, as communication, uh, the idea of this drone uh, being a catalyst and a catalyst uh, for change and development and, um, and self-empowerment. That's the last image, and it worked, so thank you. Thank you so much for this great lecture, as well as for also amplifying our message. I mean, this is fantastic to see 50 years and uh, to see how wonderful it is from going from point A to point Z, and we have, it seems like, a long journey to go. Um, so thank you so much one more time. Um, we've actually asked uh, some of our students to prepare some questions. So we have three from our students will be asking uh, questions to Lord Foster. So we'll call on the students and then we'll open it up to, to the public for m some more other questions as uh, Lord Foster uh, can take them if, if he wished to do so. Uh, so the first one is um, Van Schendel, if he's uh, around. Yes, please. Good evening, thank you for this amazing lecture. Uh, so in the actual context, when the speed of changes has become exponential, and when successful responses require that same amount of power and speed to be effective, what is, in your opinion and after your experience, the most effective way, if there's any other apart from architecture itself, to communicate to the society more than to the architects the importance of an architectural agenda for energy or a green agenda and what is the main driver to achieve significant changes? Thank you. Thank you. Um, before I answer the question, I just noticed that John Oxendorf is on the front row here. So that's a, a very powerful connection on that drone port project, because John will be one of the engineers here at Harvard who will be collaborating on the, on the project. So it's a very, very nice connection. But just to come to your, 
your question, I think it's a, it's a really interesting question. Um, and in the end, it is about the power of advocacy to raise the level, not just uh, at a professional level, but at a public level, as you quite rightly state. I don't think there is really one simple answer. If there's a, a simple answer, it has to be the political domain. And, um, and I think that as the professions uh, who engage with those issues, and I think that one of the things that concerns me is that the issues of those informal settlements, nobody really feels responsible for them. I don't think the professions at large see it as architecture. I know a number of my colleagues don't see it as architecture. They think it's crazy that one gets involved in those kind of issues. For me, it's at the essence of, of, ar of architecture. It may not be high architecture in that um, descriptive uh, terms, but if I think of cities which have been transformed through the intelligent introduction of infrastructure, good public transport, and sustainable models. It's interesting that in those cities, in those communities, the architects who are not practicing as designing architects, but have moved into the political domain and are able to be influential in their communities, in some cases as mayors or deputy mayors. And that's certainly the case in some of the South American countries that one can cite as, uh, as enlightened examples. And it's very much the case of the city uh, Bilbao, where we won a competition for a metro system. And that has had a transformative effect and in a way, pave the way for that community to take those initiatives which led uh, to the Guggenheim, Frank Geary's building, for example. So also, if I think of an individual that I've recently met and spent some time with, a guy called Paul Drayson, who's um, an inventor and, um, and interestingly has been very influential as a science minister. In, um, in a previous administration in, uh, in the UK. And he was showing me the power of an, of an app, an application on an iPhone. And this is a device that he's invented and we've been helping him uh, promote it uh, by making a short film to explain it. And, um, and what it enables the individual to do is to see the level of pollution immediately uh, in the individual's environment. So you could look at that and you could see what it was and you could compare that if that city had clean air monitors, whether those monitors were really telling the truth. He described it as saying that, uh, that, 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 that smoking habits changed when individuals realized that it wasn't just their smoke that might be affecting their health. And his point was, if you increase the level of awareness by gauges, um, then that would be, uh, that would kickstart quite radical uh, action. So I think a number of, of initiatives um, and obviously any of the technologies which together could create uh, you know, a, a more sustainable environment. Apurv? Yep. Um, there's a lot of focus use of using computation in form finding for buildings and then solving them for energy efficiency. You seem to have the opposite approach. In your practice, you've used technology extensively to investigate the interaction between energy and built mass. To what extent does this understanding of energy as a force play, in, play a role in shaping the form of your buildings? I'd say that um, the, the form of the buildings in the way that I have tried to describe it in this talk, um, you're, you're absolutely correct in your analysis that 
the computer has played a major role in terms of anticipatory design, the ability to be able to harness the power of the computer to uh, explore the environment, air movements, and to create buildings which are more efficient, which are more joyful, which are more pleasurable. Um, but, uh, but behind the scenes, if you were, and I'd encourage you to, if you were interested to follow it up, uh, to visit our studio and to see some of the ways in which we do, in, in other manners, explore form, explore uh, structures, and, um, and being able to simultaneously look at them in terms of structural efficiency, environmental efficiency, and literally to be able to hold these models to create three-dimensional models and say, which is more beautiful, which is, uh, which is more elegant, um, and, to, and, and to get that, 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 that balance. Um, so we can do things with computers that we could not do that many years ago. Um, but uh, also, one needs to remind oneself that the computer is a tool like a pencil, and it's as good as the, the, the person that's pushing the pencil or, or driving the, the computer. Um, so far, it's not, a, it's not creative in, its, in itself. Um, and, um, and if we want proof from, of the ability to create uh, buildings of extraordinary plastic sculpture, uh, you look at the work of Gaudi and, and the great cathedral builders, and it was in an age before anybody had a computer, and I think many of those things we would have difficulty doing today with computers. One last question from our student, Sabrina. Good evening, thank you for being here. Um, in your work, you've emphasized a systems approach to performance evaluation, including complicated variables such as transportation and telecommunications and energy distribution models. In the vein of your collaborator, Buckminster Fuller, the principle to do more and more with less is in the service of furthering human evolution. In today's complex world, how can we begin to understand the goal of furthering this evolution? What is it that we want more and more of? And how can we quantify it in terms of energy use? Um, I think that if, um, if I moved away from my world uh, as an architect, where I engage with other disciplines, and I listen to what some research scientists say to me, when I meet with my colleagues and I meet these, um, these extraordinary individuals and talk about the kinds of buildings that are appropriate for them. The mantra that kind of repeats itself is, we expect uh, that you'll be able to get the laboratories to work, that the liquids and the gases will all appear. The real challenge that you have as an architect is to create buildings that will break down the barriers between the different disciplines. And that's very much about the social spaces. It's about the chance interaction. Um, and so some of these buildings have uh, been designed in such a way that the circulation encourages the chance encounter. And, um, and many of the scientific breakthroughs have happened in the social spaces, not in the laboratories. They've happened over a coffee. And the reason that they've done that is because the different disciplines have come together, which brings me back to my primary response to your question. And that is that the future and that way of working is about the different disciplines coming together, the interaction between those, those disciplines. And, um, and this is the opposite of the way in which many designers are taught that they can design and then, as it were, hand out the parcel to somebody else to make it work. Um, and that, I th for me, is the opposite of what is the creative process. For me, the creative process and my colleagues and the whole sort of 50 years or whatever is built on sparking off between different disciplines. If there's a symbol, it's the round table. Thank you. Um, 
just in, in the interest of time, we will take uh, probably one or two more questions from the audience. We also don't want to strain Lord Foster. So uh, any question from the audience? can see. There we go. One. Um, Lord Foster. And I think that you just spoke to this a little bit. Um, I'm very interested in the aspect of sustainability, which uh, includes social equity. I don't think that we can have a sustainable world unless it's sustainable for everyone. I wonder if you could speak to that. I'd say that I could take you through <clears throat> each of those projects, and the emphasis would be the social agenda. I wouldn't mention a word about energy. I'd never use the word green. I could describe that it's 50 years work trying to create places and spaces that are truly democratic, that break down barriers, initially between on, in that tiny factory challenging the we and they, the posh, the scruffy, the front, the back, the management box, the workers' shed, the creation of a democratic pavilion. The building in Olsen, um, I was told the dockers are dirty, they swear, the secretaries are walk out, you can never put them even near each other. You couldn't even do two buildings close to each other. They're under the same, the same roof. Um, and it just worked like, uh, like magic. It, the, but it was, um, it was a very daring social experiment at the time, although we never would have used those, those words. Um, and um, and the, uh, the greening of the city, opening up spaces for entertainment, for social uh, interaction, each of those buildings has a very, very strong uh, agenda. And, um, and I think that part of our task, the Reichstag, uh, for example, um, the politicians who, for the first time in their lives, had to find common ground, um, because normally they're not doing their job unless they're disagreeing with each other and arguing. Uh, so for the first time, they have to find uh, consensus. And as somebody said, why would anybody ever want to go to the roof of the Reichstag? And if they went there, why would they want to have a coffee? And then the next thing I hear is it's so popular, the architect underestimated the amount of size uh, for, the, uh, for the restaurant. Um, and we can't get a coffee because there are too many people. Um, so, <laughs> so I think that, that um, you have uh, intentionally or otherwise, I think, identified a very, very strong thread through all of these projects. Great. On that note, I think we will end here. I just want to thank uh, Lord Foster one more time. We're so lucky to have you here. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for attending. And uh, hopefully we will see you next time at our next lecture. Thank you so much.